talk about I'm going to talk about work we've been doing at the U.S. Department of Energy um, on the Energy Exascale or System Model or E3SM, and we're working toward the unified treatment of sea level. But uh, a lot of what I'm going to emphasize today is our work over the last five to ten years on developing ice sheet modeling and polar ocean modeling capabilities that are kind of the necessary building blocks for sea level. And then I'll end with a short summary of our, our plans for this um, sea level enabled version of E3SM. So I'd like to acknowledge the large team I work with here at Los Alamos National Lab and across the rest of the DOE complex at the other national labs, as well as the funding from the DOE Office of Science through the Earth and Environmental System Modeling Program and the Early Career Research Program and um, the large computing allocation resources that we um, have access to. So I'd like to kind of motivate the talk with an introduction to the various components to sea level and then kind of use that to show some examples of work we've been um, doing and, and plan to do to kind of tackle all these different pieces of the sea level puzzle. So the first um, kind of set of components are the mass change components or sometimes called very static or Um, it looks to me like Matt has frozen. I'm not sure if anyone else is having those issues. Um, if you just bear with us one moment, um, hopefully he'll come back online in a moment. Yep, it looks like he's left the room, so I presume he's having some issue with his um, connection. Um, hello, am I back? You're back. Okay, not sure what happened. Sorry about that. Thanks very much. No problem. All right, so I don't know uh, when I got cut off, but I was introducing these sea level components. And so there's the, the very static or mass change components, there's ocean components, including steric change, dynamic sea level, and then there's regional effects, including solid earth effects due to gravitational deformation and rotation, which are sometimes called GRD, local subsidence or uplift processes, and then other coastal processes such as storm surge and, and estuary effects. So I'd like to kind of put a spotlight on that very first term, the ice sheet mass loss, because this is the largest uncertainty in future sea level projections. And this is the area where we at Los Alamos and DOE have spent a lot of time in the last five to 10 years on developing our ice sheet modeling capabilities to tackle this problem. So you can kind of blow up, blow up this um, ice sheet mass loss term into a number of important processes. So on the climate side, you have surface mass balance um, from the atmosphere and then basal mass balance from the ocean on the ice shelf, so sub ice shelf melting. And then within the ice sheet itself, um, there's a number of poorly resolved physical processes, including calving, basal processes, including subglacial hydrology and glacial isostatic adjustment. And I know some of this has been covered by some of your previous speakers. I think Matthew Morlaham gave a nice overview of, of this context. And I think Frank Petin did as well. So um, with this kind of background motivation, now I'm gonna um, dive into a series of, of short examples um, where these numbers are located. Of, of progress we've made in recent years and are, are, are working towards in the future uh, tackling some of these um, challenging, um, poorly understood aspects of, of these different components. So before I, I dive into those examples, I first want to give a brief introduction to E3SM, the Energy Exascale Earth System Model. So E3SM has been developed by DOE for um, mission applications, including energy impacts and national security. It's the first earth system model to use regional refined meshes in all components. So for example, we can target very high resolution along the US East Coast for you know, sea level projections in that area. Um, another kind of core aspect of E3SM is targeting exascale computing in the next five to 10 years. 
taking advantage of DOE supercomputing resources. And that will enable us to do things like ultra high resolution and large ensembles concurrently. So we've taken a fully open development stance. So you can watch code uh, branches as they're being developed and discussed on GitHub if you're so inclined. <laughs> um, the, the E3SM code branched from CESM in 2014, but since then it's uh, changed radically. Version one was released in 2019 with entirely new ocean, sea ice, and land ice components and significantly modified atmosphere and land relative to CESM. And version two is, is being finalized right now, and that will be the first uh, version that actually deploys regional refinement and all components in the um, scientific, scientifically uh, validated comp sets. So E3SM is developed at eight national labs with multiple university partners. And here at Los Alamos, we focus on the ocean, sea ice, and ice sheet components. So I'd also like to briefly introduce the MPAS Albany Land Ice or MOLLE ice sheet model, uh, which is uh, the ice sheet component of E3SM. It uses a three-dimensional first order momentum balance approximation. It has, uh, makes use of a variable resolution unstructured Voronoi mesh. So these kind of soccer ball hexagon type meshes. And it's Parallel and highly scalable, we can run efficiently in thousands of processors, and it includes automatic differentiation for inverse modeling, which we use for optimizing initial conditions. And uh, MOLLE has been a joint development effort between Los Alamos and Sandia National Labs. So just a little bit more eye candy. On the left is optimized uh, ice velocity from MOLLE on a high resolution two kilometer mesh um, compared to velocity observations, just kind of showing that optimization capability. And um, now I'd like to briefly in, um, present a few of our results from the ISMIP-6 ice sheet model inner comparison project. And I know Frank Patin did a very nice job of, of summarizing these MIPs um, a few months ago in your seminar series. So, that saves me some time introducing this. But what I've shown here is the kind of the, the baseline RCP 8.5 simulation from the ISMIP-6 Antarctica um, set of experiments. And these are just all of this, the sea level rise contribution from all the models that participated out through 2100. And then our contribution is right here in the dark pink. Um, so kind of in the middle of the pack. Uh, but I think what was kind of unique about what we were able to provide is that it was Molly was one of the two higher order three dimensional velocity solvers in the ensemble and one of two models run at two kilometer resolution or higher. And to achieve that we with our three dimensional solver we had to run on 6800 processors so it was a, a pretty big undertaking for us. We also participated in the Antarctic, Antarctic buttressing model in our comparison project. And I think, as you may have heard described, Abu MIP is an extreme and purely hypothetical upper bound mass loss for Antarctica, where all ice shelves are instantaneously eliminated and prevented from reforming. So if you look on this lower left plot, Molly's contribution is again in pink. So after about five, after 500 years, uh, sea level rise of about three meters from Antarctica is predicted by Molly. And that's again, kind of in the middle of the pack here. And in this animation, you can see that West Antarctica collapses pretty spectacularly um, with this, you know, high end extreme forcing as you might expect. So as I mentioned, the kind of strengths to Molly are the higher order three-dimensional velocity solver and the high resolution meshes that we're able to employ. But there's a lot of, there's a number of notable limitations to the version of Molly that we used for the ISMIP-6 simulations a number of years ago. And so a lot of the important physical processes in ice sheet modeling were not included. For example, we did not have temperature evolution enabled. And since then, we've verified and enabled the enthalpy solver um, for thermal evolution. In ISMIP-6, we used a fixed calving front position, which is a, a pretty big limitation. 
Since then, we've implemented and tested multiple calving laws. In ISMIP 6, we you know, tuned this basal friction coefficient um, and then kept it static in time so it didn't evolve. And we were also using a linear basal friction law and both, both of those um, um, assumptions are, are pretty poor. So since then we've implemented improved basal friction laws that use nonlinear basal friction and account for effective pressure um, at the bed. And we've also been operationally running a subglacial hydrology model that includes both distributed and channelized drainage we are working on, we have coupled the hydrology model to the basal friction, but um, it's a pretty tricky problem to get to run realistically. So that's something that's still um, in testing, I would say, although we've, we've done some work with that. And then we also did not include a glacial isostatic adjustment model. And since then we've coupled model, MOLLE to a planar viscoelastic GIA model. So um, with all these improvements, we're much happier with um, the model capability we have. And, um, I'd like to kind of dig into a few of these model improvements and kind of, you know, demonstrate the, the improvement that we get by uh, including these additional processes. And so for this first example, um, I'm going to use the uh, Humboldt Glacier in, in Northern Greenland. And this is a regional study done by Trevor Hillebrand, a postdoc here at Los Alamos. So all of this section is work that Trevor did. And so we're, you know, the, the basic question here is looking at projections of 21st century sea level contribution from Humboldt. And Humboldt Glacier in Northern Greenland contains about 19 centimeters of potential sea level rise. And it's one of the larger glaciers in Greenland. And it's also experienced uh, a very pronounced retreat in the last few decades. So you can see the calving front positions of this northern part of Humboldt um, over the last two decades or so has retreated, you know, 15 kilometers or so. And at the same time, if you look along a flow line here, you can see a very rapid increase in surface speed along this transect over the same time period. So like a threefold increase uh, in speed. So with this rapid retreat and acceleration, we are interest, we're interested in exploring what Humboldt's contribution to sea level rise would be this century and where the largest uncertainties in those projections lie. So to do this, Trevor set up a regional domain of Humboldt Glacier with one kilometer resolution near the terminus. And we're employing a standard ISMIP-6 Greenland protocol for climate forcing. So that includes surface mass balance anomalies and a frontal melting parameterization driven by ocean thermal forcing, where the surface mass balance and the thermal forcing come from climate model projections. And then kind of the, the new spin on it is, is Trevor's put a lot of work into calibrating the basal friction law and the calving law using these recent observations from the past few decades where the glaciers exhibited so much uh, rapid change. So the first step is optimizing the basal shear stress um, using the 2007 observed ice velocity. So on the left is satellite drive uh, surface speed um, and then using Molly's inverse capabilities, um, we're you know, tuning the basal friction coefficient to minimize the mismatch in modeled velocity from these observations. So the middle shows the result for the basal shear stress um, across the domain. And then when we run the model forward, we get a modeled surface speed on the right that looks you know, very similar to the observations. So with that um, basal shear stress optimization, that um, tells us what the basal shear stress is, but it doesn't inform much on the form of the basal friction law. But to get more information about that, we can look at the velocity field at different time slices and see which form of the basal friction law can best reproduce those speed ups. So we've employed kind of a generic effective pressure dependent power law shown here, where we're assuming the effective pressure is that from a perfect connection with the ocean. And then the, um, the basal friction um, parameter is we were able to get from that initial optimization. And then the unknown is 
the exponent on the velocity in the power law. And so in the center here, I've shown this uh, profile of observed speed up. It's, it's flipped on the X axis from what I showed a few slides ago. But basically in 2007, in the dark colors, um, up through 2017 in yellow, you can see this rapid speed up to over 1,000 meters per year at the terminus. So if we use a linear basal friction law like we had in our ISMIP-6 experiments, we see hardly any acceleration at all. And it, we need uh, quite a small exponent, so something like 1 10th or 1 20th in the, in the power law in order to achieve uh, uh, the, sorry, um, the speed up that was observed. So um, this indicates that there's a fairly, uh, there's a quite plastic bed conditions at Humboldt Glacier, which is not surprising given it's a marine terminating glacier that uh, has a bed well below sea level. So um, through this process, Trevor has identified kind of a range of exponent values that give kind of permissible results um, compared to these observations. So that allows us to constrain the form of the basal friction law. So the uh, next can I, is, can I interrupt you a second? Sorry, uh, sure. got a question in the chat. Um, I should have asked you at the start, do you mind if we randomly ask you? Yeah, that's fine. Uh, we yeah. can adjust. I might run over, but we can adjust accordingly. So yeah. Um, so yeah, I see Olga asked if mu can vary with time. And uh, for this um, set of analysis, we've assumed that it cannot. Um, a kind of separate thread of work we're doing that I'm not showing in this talk is using the subglacial hydrology model to, um, you know, to inform the basal friction. Um, and that's a trickier problem. So for this, allowing mu to vary and resolve the exponent at the same time would have been um, too many things to, to solve for simultaneously. But that's a good point. It certainly is possible that mu can vary in time. Okay, so then the next step is to tune the iceberg calving. So here the target, so this is using the tuned basal friction from the last slide. And the target is the observed velocity field and observed margin position at the end of the observational period. So after 10 years have elapsed in 2017. And so that target field is in the lower right in red. And so you can see there's, um, it's, it's, the ice is moving it quite fast in this Northern region. And we're employing a von Mises stress calving law, which has been used um, fairly frequently for Greenland in the last five years described by Matthew Morlehem. And in this um, calving law, the calving rate is equal to the ice velocity at the ice front times the ratio of the von Mises stress calculated by the model to a threshold yield stress, which is a, basically a tunable parameter. And so um, these three plots here show results at after the 10 years have elapsed in 2017 for three different threshold yield stress um, parameter value choices. And you can and basically see when we use a, a yield stress of 200 kilopascals, uh, the ice has not sped up enough. It's, it's too slow and there's been very little retreat. If we use 150 kilopascals, it's retreated too much and, and sped up way too much. And something in the ballpark of 175 kilopascals is kind of like the best trade-off for this particular calving law. So based on this process, Trevor selected uh, like a, a subset of yield stress values along with the subset of basal friction values to build an ensemble of, of kind of permissible model configurations that are able to hindcast the recent past. And so with that, he's run an ensemble of these tuned configurations out to 2100 using two climate um, forcings. So they're both RCP 8.5 climate scenarios from two of the climate models that the ISMIP-6 protocol identified as working well for Greenland. And so these plots here just show the evolution from 2007 out to 2050, out to 2100. And we're seeing substantial retreat in the northern part of Humboldt, very little retreat in the southern part, and you know acceleration over most of the glacier. So for context, there was a, a recent study that um, estimated uh, about three and a half millimeters of sea level rise from Humboldt by 2100. And this um, 
Choi study was a Greenland wide study. So they weren't targeting Humboldt specifically, and you know, they weren't considering these recent observations to constrain um, their model projection. So this is kind of like a, a baseline estimate to compare our work against. So when Trevor uses the same linear basal friction law that, that Choi had used, so not our tuned basal friction, just the standard linear basal friction, um, he got something like four to five millimeters of sea level rise by 2100. And this range of uncertainty accounts for the range of uncertainty in the tuning of the calving law. And so this is kind of like in the same ballpark as the previous estimate if we use the same friction law. However, if we switch to the tuned nonlinear basal friction, the more plastic bed, and even if Trevor keeps calving rates at observed rates and doesn't actually use the von Mises calving law, we still get substantially more sea level rise, so about five and a half millimeters. Then if he actually turns on the von, Mi the von Mises calving law and allows it to prognostically evolve over the course of the simulation, um, then that leads to sea level rise that's two to three times as much as the previous study. And so um, this cyan band is for kind of the low range of calving sensitivity based on the tuning he did. This is the medium range and this is the high range. So it ends up being um, quite a lot larger when both the nonlinear basal friction and the evolving calving are um, enabled. And there's some positive feedbacks between those two physical processes in the model that lead to this large uncertainty and large range. So to conclude this kind of this first section um, with these, you know, new physical parameterizations and tuning to recent past, we see two to three times as much sea level rise in the projections relative to a recent um, estimate. And these recent observations are a powerful constraint on the form of the basal friction law and, and the ability to tune the model. And the largest remaining uncertainty is calving. So an improved understanding of calving physics is necessary for improving forecasts of sea level rise. And that's nothing new. A lot of people have been saying that for years, but this kind of clearly demonstrates that. And so to that end, um, we're currently testing a damage-based calving law that we think will be more physically realistic than the von Mises one that we've um, used here. Okay. So again, Brian, it, quickly again the, the, there's another question in the chat from the uh, question from Vivian. Oh, and from, from Steve. Yeah, so, okay. So yeah, so Vivian asked, do you assume that the processes such as calving basal friction, ice sliding velocity, et cetera, that you observe today will be the same in the future? Will there be changes in the relative importance of these various processes as time goes on? So I would say by having prognostic parameterizations of these processes, we at least allow the possibility that um, they are able to change naturally in the future within the constraints of, of what's included in the parameterizations. And I would admit that the kind of current generation of parameterizations for calving and basal physics are still fairly limited, but at the same time, they're a very large improvement over kind of what we had done previously in a lot of, like, and a lot of I think, ice sheet models have been relying on um, until fairly recently, which is like, you know, there's no calving at all, or there's um, basal friction that doesn't change in time at all. So we're moving in the right direction. This isn't the end, um, but um, I think, the, uh, the parameterizations we're using at least allow the, the system to evolve. Um, so then Steve Griffey's asked, can you briefly summarize the positive feedback that enhances melt depending on calving relation? Yeah, I can do that. So if we go back and look at this calving law, the calving rate is proportional to the ice velocity at the margin. That's how this parameterization was constructed. And so when the ice speeds up, calving is going to increase, you know, um, and as calving increases, you can get faster retreat and that can lead to 
more acceleration. And so you can get this positive feedback. Um, and actually, the when this von Mises stress calving law has been implemented in the past, there's been um, at times or some instances have had to employ like a speed limit on calving that it can't exceed, say, three kilometers a year or something. So the, by construction, it's, it's quite sensitive to uh, this potential positive feedback, which is part of the reason why we're interested in trying this damage calving law, which would not be um, subject to this same feedback. All right, so I see another question from Olga about how do you know what's the right direction? I guess I'm not sure uh, in what context that question is. Maybe we can circle back to that one at the end because I know Olga could probably ask me questions for hours. Okay. Um, where was I? Okay. So the, the next uh, little section I want to talk about here is um, moving down to Antarctica, specifically Thwaites Glacier, and looking at solid earth ice sheet interactions. And so this is um, going to focus on glacial isostatic adjustment as kind of a missing process from at least our, our models um, until recently. And then I'll touch a little bit on basal processes at Thwaites as well. And this was uh, work done as a student project by Cameron Book, who's now moved on to working at NOAA. And this is in collaboration with Sam Kachuk at University of Michigan, who wrote the GIA model that we're using. OK, so, so just for a little bit of background motivation here um, on the time scales of glacial isostatic adjustment in Antarctica. On the left, I've shown a, uh, a map of mantle viscosity, mantle viscosity derived from seismic ob observations for Antarctica. And in East Antarctica, the viscosity is kind of typical of, of terrestrial crust and uh, around the globe. Whereas in West Antarctica, there's anomalously low viscosity by you know, three or four orders of magnitude lower. And so um, the Earth's, uh, the solid Earth is, is typically modeled as with a Maxwell model where there's an immediate elastic response and a gradual viscous response. And over short time scales, it's been generally assumed that the viscous response can be ignored because the viscosity is so large. And so if you approximate the Maxwell time for the Earth's crust, a typical value would be about 300 years. So at timescales shorter than that, you only need to consider the elastic response because the viscous response is going to be too small to matter much. However, for the viscosity values that are, have been estimated for West Antarctica, it turns out that it's something more like three years for West Antarctica. And so we're not the first to, to want to model this, but um, I'm going to kind of present our investigation at exploring this for Thwaites Glacier. So this matters because of West Antarctica being a marine ice sheet. And as I know has been discussed in previous seminars in, your, in this seminar series, um, that the a grounding line on a reverse bed slope can potentially be unstable due to the marine ice sheet instability due to a positive feedback between flux and ice thinning. And this depends on a, a host of factors, including lateral buttressing and um, the, the details of the shape of the bed and things like that. But there's the potential for unstable retreat. However, bedrock uplift has the potential to slow the grounding line retreat in ice sheet mass loss. So when you have um, substantial uplift from GIA, it can effectively lift the glacier out of the water and um, reduce this um, unstable retreat. So um, to that end, we're using this GIA model, Gaia Pi, that Sam Kachuk at University of Michigan um, developed, and he described it in a paper last year in GRL, applying it to Pine Island Glacier next door, uh, coupled with the bicycles model. And But here, we're coupling it to Mali. And Sam's model has an elastic lithosphere layer um, with a two-layer viscous mantle underneath. And so we're exploring four different kind of parameter sets for the GIA model. 
On the right here, this typical is typical for the Earth's crust, so typical velocities and fluctual rigidity. And then we have three different flavors of low viscosity um, uh, parameter values um, that are suggested by recent um, observations of, of GPS uplift on bedrock um, in West Antarctica. And then one of those is a variant that includes a high flectoral rigidity. The details aren't too important, but they're kind of like exploring the, the range of possible low viscosity. So cutting straight to the results, uh, when we include GIA with low viscosity, it substantially reduces grounding line retreat. So in this animation, the white grounding line position over time is without the GIA included in the model. And this orange one is one of our low viscosity simulations. So you can see after, I'll just skip to the end here. After about 300 years, there's a, a few hundred kilometers less grounding line retreat with this low viscosity um, effect. So um, kind of to summarize that, here's uh, sea level rise uh, estimated from Thwaites Glacier out to 300 years for these different simulations. So when we don't include GIA in the model at all, you get this purple line. So about um, 25 or 30 centimeters of sea level rise at year 300. If we include GIA, but with the typical um, solid earth parameters, uh, there's hardly any change out to 300 years. And that's consistent with that Maxwell time estimate we made um, on the first slide. However, when we include the low viscosity versions of the model, um, we get much reduced sea level rise and it can be reduced by as much as about 70% depending on um, how low of a viscosity um, you actually go with. So kind of the conclusion here is that glacial isostatic adjustment, including the viscous response cannot be ignored at IPCC time scales in West Antarctica. And you know, Sam's paper made this case last year and um, a few other studies have, have demonstrated that as well. But this is, um, our results for weights with Molly. So I'm just going to make a brief detour while we're on the topic of Thwaites to mention a kind of related project on looking at basal friction and subglacial hydrology at Thwaites Glacier. And this is part of a PhD project by Alex Hager at the University of Oregon, who's been working with us. And what Alex did was he ran the subglacial hydrology model within Molly. Um, for a 100 plus member ensemble looking at parameter sensitivity to the parameters in the hydrology model. And then he would validate these individual runs based on specularity, radar specularity observations from Dusty Schrader. And these radar specularity observations are able to differentiate from where the subglacial drainage system is at full capacity or under capacity. So it doesn't necessarily tell you where there's channels or not, but it just tells you if the, the system is, is saturated or not. And so um, using this radar constraint, he was able to you know, throw out a number, a large fraction of this ensemble and only retain the ensemble members that um, pass this uh, specularity uh, constraint. And after having done that, every single validated ensemble member exhibits extensive channelization beneath Thwaites Glacier. And kind of a typical example is shown here on the left, where the colors in the background show effective pressure at the bed and the uh, channel discharge is in is these uh, blue and purple colors. So there's not channels everywhere. There's a few very large channels, and they're large enough to kind of lower the effective pressure over large swaths of the glacier. And so this is important because as I just said, channels significantly increase the effective pressure near the grounding line. So if you look at this profile plot that Alex put together on the bottom, if he runs the model without channels, so the distributed um, drainage model only, you get this gray curve. So you get very low effective pressure for hundreds of kilometers um, from the grounding line. But when the channels are included in the model, and, and that's the version of the model that matches the radar observations, then you get much higher effective pressures in the terminal region. And this ends up looking very different from the ocean connection parameterization for effective pressure that's commonly used. And you may have noticed that I said we used it in our, our Humboldt study. 
And so the extensive channelization that you're seeing here uh, may be a stabilizing force to retreat. So a future part of Alex's project, which is ongoing work, is, is running a, a version of Molly where the subvectional hydrology model is coupled to the ice dynamics to see what impact these channels have on the future evolution of Thwaites. Okay, so that was my brief foray into subglacial hydrology. So I'm going to zoom out a little bit and at least get off the ice sheets and into the ocean. So we're getting a little closer to sea level rise. And so um, this section is going to look at the basal mass balance of Antarctica. Um, so sub ice shelf melting driven by the ocean. And this is a new capability in E3SM and the E3SM's ocean component to include circulation and melting beneath ice shelves. And specifically, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the challenge of tipping points in um, Antarctic ice shelves. And this is work done by a very large group of people. And my contribution is a, a small part of this. Um, most of, mostly at Los Alamos on the E3S T, E3SM team um, and a lot of the ocean modeling group here. Okay. so. As I'm sure most of you are fully aware, ice shelves are the primary control on sea level rise from Antarctica due to their buttressing effect on the grounded ice um, behind them. And in regions where there has been significant warming of the ocean, there's been more rapid retreat or uh, more substantial thinning that's been seen. So uh, we, we see physical evidence of that in addition to kind of theory suggesting that. Um, Vivian, how about I circle back to your subglacial hydrology question at the end? Okay. Okay. Um, but I do want to talk about that because that's one of my favorite topics. <laughs> okay, so um, so despite this fact that um, we know the importance of of subshelf melting, most climate models, and including until recently E3SM, do not resolve cavities beneath ice shelves. Oops. And so we basically have this schematic on the left where there's essentially a vertical wall at the front of the ice shelf and the ocean model just stops. So our recent work has been to break down that wall and um, allow the ocean to circulate beneath the ice shelf and resolve the, and prognostically model the melting of, of the sub of the ocean driven subshelf melting. Um, I should put in a side here that we're currently still working on the coupling of Molly ice sheet evolution to the E3SM ocean model. And that's um, pretty far along, but there's still some limitations with wetting and drying in the ocean model and some limitations in the coupler that prevents like a, a fully dynamic evolution of, of that coupled system. But we're hoping to get there in the next few years. So this new E3SM cryosphere configuration includes subshelf circulation with static ice shelves. And basically we've gone from a represent, representation of Antarctic freshwater fluxes on the top to what you see on the bottom. So on the top, we basically had solid and liquid runoff that was just kind of splattered around the periphery of Antarctica um, as a, a freshwater flux that was um, just kind of uniformly spread around the continent. However, after we're actually able to resolve and prognostically calculate subshelf melting, you get something like this lower left um, plot showing the freshwater fluxes to the ocean occurring you know, beneath the ice shelves at the correct depth. And then additionally, we don't have the ability to have a prognostic iceberg model yet. So as a stopgap measure, we've implemented this Marino et al climatology of iceberg melting in the Southern Ocean. And this is a monthly climatology that allows us to get the iceberg melt component um, included in um, our simulations. Okay, so with that new capability, um, I want to kind of talk a little bit about conditions in the Southern Ocean. And I imagine as a lot of people are aware, we have, there are warm and cold ice shelves and continental shelves in Antarctica. And whether there's high or low melt rates um, basically depends on the 
the extent to which there is access of circumpolar deep water onto the continental shelf. And so on the left, you see observations of seafloor potential temperature on the continental shelf. And in the Amundsen and Bellingshausen seas, it's much warmer due to the presence of CDW on the continental shelf. And the rest of the continent, CDW does not intrude, and you have much cooler continental shelf temperatures because the wa dominant water mass there is dense shelf water that's primarily formed um, from sea ice brine rejection and Antarctic surface processes. And the map of melt rates, you know, matches this distribution of, of ocean temperature, not surprisingly. So um, that's kind of like the broad scale pattern we're hoping to be able to reproduce in E3SM. And to a large extent, we're able to do that. So on the top is seafloor potential temperature, the bottom is salinity. And with E3SM on the left, a real analysis state estimate, that's kind of like the, the best estimate of, of what things look like in the middle and the difference plot on the right. So at least in broad strokes, we're getting warm water on the continental shelf in the correct parts of West Antarctica and cold water pretty much everywhere else. So we're generally happy with this. And as you might expect, we're able to produce ice shelf melt rates shown on the left that look quite similar to observations because we're getting the right water masses in the right places. That's all fine and good. However, when we run the model long enough, um, we eventually see an instability develop at Filchnerani ice shelf, starting with the Filchner ice shelf. And this plot on the bottom shows a time series of melt rates over 110 years from E3SM for the Filchner ice shelf. And this blue band is um, observed melt rates, so basically what our target is. And we're you know, right in that blue band for the first 98 years, and then there's a sudden tenfold increase in melt rates that happens over the course of a decade. And if you are watching this tiny little movie, you can see we have um, CDWs offshore, off the continental shelf break, and then there's occasional intrusions of CDW through the Filchner trough right here, which are seen in observations. But eventually those intrusions become um, permanent and flood the entire filchner ice shelf. And that's when this melt regime switch occurs, this tipping point. And we're not the first to see this. Um, Helmer et al in a 2012 Nature paper and some follow-up papers have also um, demonstrated this uh, mode switching tipping point for filter on the ice shelf. Um, and then just to kind of understand the implications for this, if this were to, to unfold, we did a simulation using our two kilometer um, ISMIP-6 configuration of MOLLE where we just, um, increase the melt rates under filter Rani by a factor of 10. And we get this cumulative sea level rise curve um, due to that um, increased melt rate alone. So it's about, um, after a hundred years, it's about 40, uh, sorry, about 40 millimeters. And this is comparable to adding a second modern day weights glacier to the sea level budget if this uh, tipping point were to occur. So that kind of to, to dig in a bit more into the process that's that's causing this to happen is that the intrusion of CDW activates a uh, melt, the so-called melt pump beneath the ice shelf, which is a tipping point between a low melt stable configuration and a high melt stable configuration. So in the low melt cold ice shelf situation, you have this dense shelf water from brine rejection that's uh, kind of blocking um, the intrusion of offshore water of, this, of the CDW offshore. So you have this configuration on the top. However, if CDW is able to intrude and it, it will increase uh, melting significantly at the base of the ice shelf. And uh, if that persists for long enough, it de develops a strong overturning circulation that pulls in additional CDW in a self-sustaining feedback. And once that circulation sets up, it's um, kind of a permanent switch to this high melt regime that is very difficult to then shut off again. So that's exactly what we're, we're seeing in our simulations. 
And um, you can see that very nicely here in these Hofmuller plots of temperature, salinity, and northward velocity at the Filchner sill. So this is lo the location where CDW first intrudes on the, onto the continental shelf. So on the top, I have the time series of melt rates, and you can see when this tipping point uh, kicks off around year 98. But um, if you look at this Hofmuller plot of temperature, you see um, cold, uh, water, so this is the, the dense shelf water present for the first many decades, and then you start to see these intrusions, these temporary occurrences of warm water at depth, and they're accompanied by a salty signal, so it's warm saline water, which is the hallmark of uh, circumpolar deep water. And when these intrusions occur, you also see a switching from northward flow off the continental shelf to southward flow onto the continental shelf. So all these indicators you know, clearly show that it's CDW intrusions that are occurring. And observations from moorings and ship casts and seals in the wet LC show that these seasonal CDW intrusions at the shelf break are common. However, they don't reach all the way to the Filchner ice shelf and they are not permanent. And so what we see is eventually at year 98, this intrusion becomes strong enough to kind of take over and set up a permanent flow reversal. So um, looking, so we see this mode switching in our historical simulations, which obviously is, is not correct. And so in trying to investigate the, the source of this, uh, a thing we identified quite quite quickly was that we have a fairly significant fresh bias on the continental shelf. So this figure on the right is our fresh bias of um, about 0.3 PSU on the Weddell Sea continental shelf in this region. And that, um, that leads to a corresponding decrease in density of the dense shelf water on the continental shelf. And that reduction in density allows the the denser CDW offshore to kind of push onshore and, and set up shop there. And so this um, fresh bias, we, it, is, it's kind of uh, a problem we've seen in um, pervasively in our low resolution version one E3SM simulations. But we also noticed that it's exacerbated by the fact that we have elevated melt rates by the smaller ice shelves in the Eastern Wet LC and Drawning Modland. And so um, these two plots just show time series of simulated melt rates for the Brunt, Stancombe, and Fimble ice shelves, along with the kind of target observational range in these blue bands again. So you can see E3SM in these ice shelves is, is predicting melt rates that are like two to five times higher than they should be. And so this got us thinking, could this excess melt be part of the problem? in these nearby ice shelves. And so um, before I get into that, I should also point out that we've identified that improvements to an, our eddy transport parameterization and increasing, increasing model resolution also greatly reduce this fresh, these fresh bias issues. So this um, issue related to excess melt from nearby ice shelves isn't the only thing and maybe not the major thing, but it is one of the factors that was leading to um, uh, the tipping point occurring in our simulation. So it was kind of an interesting thread that we wanted to follow up on. And so um, to do this, we ran a branch run where at 50 years from the first run where we just disabled melting from all the ice shelves in East Antarctica, like shown in this map. And uh, when we do that, you can look at this Hofmuller plots for temperature, salinity, and velocity for this branch run shown here down below. And you can see we still see these occasional CDW intrusions, which again is supported by observations, but they don't have the duration or the magnitude that they did in the original run, and they never um, set up a, a permanent intrusion. And this time series cuts off at about year 115, but this simulation ran out to year 160, and there was still no sign of, um, of the tipping point um, developing at all. So in these simulations, it, we've seen that disabling ice shelf melt from these upstream ice shelves prevents the sustained CDW intrusion and avoids the tipping point in Filtnerani ice shelf melting. 
So with that, I'll just kind of conclude this section. And the, the main points here is that the E3SM cryosphere configuration includes Antarctic ice shelf cavities and prognostic melt fluxes in a global um, climate model. And we see evidence of CDW incursion leading to the mode switching from cold to warm cavities. And this occurs due to relatively modest and local biases. So this really presents a challenge for representing Antarctic ice shelves in a low resolution global coupled model is that, you know, the conditions at a very local location like the Filchner sill, you know, have to be uh, in a, uh, constrained very carefully or, and there's not much room for error um, when you have a, a bi-stable um, system like um, cold and warm Antarctic ice shelves. And then the kind of interesting result we came up with is that one of the potential triggers for this tipping point could be enhanced ice shelf melting from these upstream ice shelves. And it raises the potential possibility of ice shelf, ice shelf melt teleconnections and you know uh, the concern that should these neighboring ice shelves develop higher melt rates, it could have this domino effect on Filchner Rani. So that said, the other kind of issues and biases in this version one of our model prevent like a very clean um, projection of, of this event, but just from kind of a physical process standpoint, our simulations indicate that this is something to to think about. Okay, so I just have one last section um, to kind of wrap up the talk. And this is more aspirational. There's been very little work done on this. And so this is where we're headed next. And this is developing a sea level enabled E3SM. And I've shown this roadmap of the sea level components I introduced at the beginning uh, again. And up till now, I've pretty much only talked about that very first term in green, ice sheet mass loss. And so now the goal is to kind of zoom back out and try to take stock of all these other components and be able to treat them in a unified way within E3SM. And so um, I'd like to present this, um, the sea level budget in a slightly different way. And this is a nice figure from the IPCC AR5 report. And these processes shown on this figure are the processes necessary for calculating global mean sea level. So the ones we've talked about already, ice sheets, glaciers, groundwater and reservoirs, and thermal expansion. If you want to actually get regional sea level, which is what matters for policymakers um, and, um, and, and local impacts, then additionally, you need the density and circulation changes in the ocean and very important are the gravity and solid earth effects. And that combined with the global mean sea level information will can allow calculation of regional sea level. And then if you wanna go one step further to actually looking at sea level impacts, it's also necessary to have information on waves and storm surge. So there's a lot of pieces. However, climate models do not currently predict sea level very well, despite the fact that sea level is a major, sea level rise is a major expected impact of climate change. And so climate models currently really only address the things in this blue box. And even then they are typically calculated after the fact, um, as opposed to prognostically as the simulation is occurring. Um, and just as an example, I've shown results for these two components from E3SM. So the top plot shows 20th century um, steric sea level change from our historical ensemble and dynamic sea level change on the bottom. So like right now in E3SM, like many other climate models, that's about as far as we can get with um, the sea level problem. So at, on the other hand, um, the process for making sea level projections is to linearly add the contributions from all these different components that I've described here. And out of necessity, those are often using disparate and often inconsistent sources. And um, there's no uh, possibility of kind of, of nonlinear interactions between these 
or, or dependencies between these terms. So regional sea level at a given point on the globe is just the sum of all these different terms in, in the plot above. So um, the goal of this new sea level enabled E3SM project is to add a sea level equation or um, global GIA model as a new component to E3SM. And that would then be coupled to the ocean and ice sheet components. And then we will be adding regional sea level representation to both the ocean and ice sheet models. And in the ocean, that will also um, include transitioning from a Boussinesque to a non Boussinesque formulation so that um, we're mass conserving instead of volume conserving and introducing variable bathymetry in time and a variable gravity field in space and time. And so this is um, work that is just starting up and there's two new postdocs joining the project, uh, Sophie Colson from Harvard and Holly Hahn from the Gill University. And we'll be um, using the sea level model developed um, at Harvard and McGill um, as part of this um, model development. And I've just shown here some example sea level fingerprint um, results that Sophie generated for the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets. So this sort of representation will, will be slowly folding into E3SM. And so the science objectives of the, of the project are firstly to kind of validate this existing approach to regional sea level projections that simply linearly adds the independently estimated contributions to confirm that there's no important um, um, dependencies between those processes that can lead to interactions that aren't being accounted for. And then we'll also um, be quantifying feedbacks between sea level and other components of the Earth system with a focus on the Antarctic ice sheet. And then the ultimate goal, of course, is to use this capability to predict how future sea level changes will affect um, global coastlines with a focus on the US East Coast and um, effects of storm surge as calculated by the model. So I'm just gonna show this, uh, this roadmap one final time um, to end the talk. Um, I've talked uh, mostly about these ice sheet mass loss components, but you know, our goals for, for unifying all, all these pieces into a single framework and uh, the pieces in black are things we're actively working on. The pieces in gray are, are things that we're probably going to be tackling uh, later on in the project um, or, or after the project ends. So um, I'll end here and just very quick summary. Um, E3SM has, is, is maturing ice sheet and polar ocean modeling capabilities, and we're working towards a comprehensive rep representation of sea level in the model. And again, I'd like to acknowledge funding from DOE Office of Science and the great team we have working on this at Los Alamos and at other national labs. So I'll stop there. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thanks very much. Thanks so much, uh, Matt, for, for a really interesting and well-rounded uh, talk. Um, so uh, uh, um, if anyone would like to ask a question, please message us in the chat or uh, put up your hand. I believe there's a question from um, Vivian way back. When perhaps we should start uh, with that. We've got Dorothy raising her hand. Um, Matt, can you remember what Vivian was, was asking the question? Yes. About? She asked to, if I could explain how increasing channel pressure near the grounding line slows retreat. So I kind of skimmed through that pretty quickly, but um, channels at the bed are much more efficient than a distributed drainage network. And when channels grow, they, they reduce the water pressure kind of over a, a large catchment region. And by reducing the water pressure, they increase the basal friction. And so channelization leads to more friction at the bed. And that's what is slowing grounding line retreat. And I should say, we haven't shown that it's showing grounding line re retreat. We haven't done those simulations yet, but that would be the hypothesis that we expect to see. Oh. We have a, a couple of hands raised. Um, Dorothy, uh, would you like to unmute? 
Thanks. Yeah, really interesting talk. Thank you, Matt. Um, I'm curious. I've worked on and continue to work on the bottom of the Camp Century ice core in which there are terrestrial macrofossils. And I'm wondering if the Humboldt, whether that's close enough to the Humboldt glacier that the deglaciation of that uh, Camp Century area would be similar to the Humboldt, or if you have any comment on that. I don't know. I mean, most of this business end of Humboldt it has a bed well below sea level. So it would be um, even without considering changes in sea level um, in paleo times, it would still be marine um, based. Mm -hmm. So it's probably a fairly different setting than okay. you're working on. It's just not that far away. It's Northwest Greenland. So I was just right. curious about you know, thinking as we know, this did um, retreat. What what the whole dynamics might have been in terms of isostatic uplift, and um, but that's yeah. I know you're not especially working on that. I was yeah. just curious. I mean, I, I guess I'd add like paleo ice sheet modeling is something that at DOE we haven't spent much time on, and I, I think it's kind of. A, a little bit missing from our portfolio, but um, yeah, it's a really interesting problem. There's extremely valuable constraints in the paleo record, of course, on what the ice sheets are capable of doing in terms of their dynamics. So I think that is, that's a direction I'd like to see us be able to do more work in. I don't know if, if that's gonna be possible, but it certainly would be valuable. It would be great, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, thanks so much, Dorothy. Uh, Olga, would you like to... Um... Thank you. Great talk, Matt. Um, may I ask you to share your slides again and go to the tweets where you showed the retreat due to the... Um, actually, you had two. One about the um, retreat due to GIA. Or you can probably just, yeah, uh, what answer. What was the... Uh, driving force, you know, when you drive your grounding line, you drove with something that was forcing. So what was that? Was it? Yeah, so we're using the ISMIP 6 subshelf melt. Okay, part. so you're driving it with mounting. So, and what is the magnitude of the uplift? You are showing sea level centimeters, but I'm more curious in the magnitude of the bad topography uplift the bed itself. So here's a map of uplift. These are slightly different simulations than what I showed, but it is, it's roughly similar. So, and these are for a, a couple different or two different parameter sets, but on the order of 100 meters uplift after 300 years. Uh, so in 100 years, that would be something on the order 10, 20 meters, 20, 30. Yeah, I mean, it, it it's kind of exponential, but after a hundred years, it would probably be like some tens of meters of uplift. Okay, so it's well within the uncertainties of bad topography known now. Yeah, it's within the uncertainties, but you know, it's pretty spatially broad. So it would be more like a, a significant bias all in one direction across the entire bed as opposed to uncertainty in individual bed elevations. At, specific locations. Uh, and if I may ask another question, it's again about weights when you showed the um, subglacial oh, effective pressure. Yeah. Yeah. The magnitudes, yeah. How do you explain three, what, megapascal of effective pressure? 3,000 kilopascal. Yeah, that might just be a unit labeling issue. I'd have to go back and check that. I can follow up with you if you want, but- oh, It's all right, it just doesn't 
Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's a good point. The relative magnitudes, I'm sure, are correct, but the maybe the units are off. So, and the question I left in the chat, sorry for taking so much time, is uh, how do you know what is the right direction for the basal sliding? The direction of... In terms of the development for the basal sliding. Uh, what do you mean by direction? Well, you said that they are going in, in the right direction in terms of kind of development. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I could state it as assuming that basal friction doesn't change in time is certainly a bad assumption. And so adding the ability for that to prognostically evolve based on our current state of theory is presumably a step in the right direction. And the more- But if the theory is wrong, I mean, I always like, like that people so believe in the current theorists. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's always a potential problem, right? I think having, as we accumulate longer temporal records of this kind of dramatic glacier change, those are the types of data sets that allow us to test the theory. And the fact that this theory works better with a more plastic bed, which is also what the theory suggests should exist in a marine terminating glacier, you know, is about as good as we can do right now. But as we accumulate more records like this at more glaciers, it allows us to, to test that theory. So, you know, as you know, in the world of ice sheet modeling, we can kind of only go with the best available knowledge with the humble acknowledgement that that, that, you know, glaciology is still a pretty young field and a lot of this may change. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thanks for your questions. Uh, thanks, Olga. Um, I don't see any other hands up. Um, do we have any other uh, questions from the group? Silence. Sorry, quiet. Oh, uh, Laurie. Yeah, I was just wondering about this idea of uh, a switch to a warm regime ice shelf. Uh, so that, so I kind of understand that switch, but there are some uh, forces that would prevent that from kicking in, like the amount of deep water production or dense water production on the shelf itself. But in the other direction, are there ways that you can turn off a warm water ice shelf? Yeah, so not work that we've done, but some recent studies have shown a strong hysteresis to this and that so if you adjust say the climate forcing so the, the freshwater fluxes at the surface or the wind forcing in such a way that it kind of initiates this tipping point regime shift and then you switch from a cold shelf to a warm shelf and that feedback sets up and then you remove that climate forcing it will not return to the previous state. So there are two stable states. And so it requires a quite a significant push to return it to the, to, the, to the low melt regime again, even if the original climate forcing is removed, which is, you know, um, basically kind of the definition of a tipping point. And so what those studies have shown, and there's a really nice study by Hazel um, from 2019, that um, you basically would have to turn off the subshelf melting to kind of turn off that melt pump for a number of years for that um, overturning circul that vertical overturning circulation to be disabled and return to the previous state. But you really can't turn off the melt, so you have to turn <laughs> off the ocean temperature on the continental shelf in front of the ice shelf. Yeah, so I guess the other way you could do it is by a much stronger sea ice production and uh, more intense brine rejection that would 
um, reestablish that density barrier from of the dense shelf water on the continental shelf. So if that were strong enough to kind of block the um, higher density circumpolar deep water, that would be one way. And then the other way is if you could suppress the thermocline at the shelf break significantly that you essentially push the CDW below the shelf break and it no longer has access to the continental shelf. The uh, first one might be uh, an investigation of whether catabatics are becoming stronger in, mm -hmm. in future scenarios, right? Yeah, no, those are really interesting questions. We haven't actually thought about what you would need to do to turn this off again. And that could be a pretty interesting investigation. All right, great talk, thanks. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, that's a fascinating problem. What are the, what are the specific cases that would uh, produce this sufficiently strong sea ice production to turn it off? Yeah. Um, yeah. Are, are there any are there any uh, further questions from anyone? Um, okay, okay. We're quite a bit over time, um, and I think that's because I encourage people to ask questions throughout the talk. Um, I hope that's okay. I think it's nice to have multiple uh people throughout talking every so often um but yeah thanks ever so much again uh matthew for for uh, speaking with us it's, it's been a fascinating talk and it's a great contribution to the series um <coughs> yeah i uh, we should probably uh, cut off soon uh, as as we're quite a bit over time now um but yeah thanks again everyone for joining us um yeah, thanks for having me and thanks everyone for sticking around um, these as we went over. Thanks all. I hope you all have a, a great rest of the day and um, we'll see you all uh, next week. All right. Bye. Bye.